So uh, what we are going to discuss today, we are going to, we just have some, summed up the, uh, the development of the, uh, the kidneys and the, the, the ureters, which are the excretory units of our body. Uh, now we are going to discuss the development of the reservoir for the urine, that is the urinary bladder, which is the terminal part of the urinary system. And that is, we all know uh, from our adult anatomy knowledge, that is located in the pelvis of our body. While the kidneys do not stay, they do develop in the, in the, in the pelvic region, in the pelvic cavity. But as we remember that we, they usually ascend up in normal circumstances, both of our kidneys escape out the pelvic cavity and reside in the upper lumbar region which is in, inside the abdominal cavity. So they are no more the pelvic organs. The ureters, they, they, they are pelvic organs, uh, they are the pelvic tubes because they have to open up into the reservoir, which is known as the urinary bladder, and it is located within the pelvic cavity. So let's talk about the formation of the urinary bladder. If you remember from our uh, last talk, that the, the two mesonephric ducts and eventually the two ureters, which were the out pocketings from the, the distal end of the mesonephric ducts, they were opening into a, a blind sac or a blind pouch, which is the end of the hindgut, and that is known as the cloaca. Okay? So our urinary bladder uh, has been formed by the cloaca. Okay? So here, if, if you look at this sketch, it's a very, very basic, simplified drawing showing you the, part, the steps of the partitioning of cloaca. So this is a common cloaca into which the, uh, the, the mesonephric ducts were opening and eventually the two ureters right and left were opening. Okay? And the urine got collected in the common cloaca. But as the fetus is, is developing and all its systems are growing, and transforming into the adult form, and so is the cloaca. So what happens from the sides of the uh, body wall in the pelvic region, uh, like a, a septum-like extension of the mesoderm, because we, know, we remember that the cloaca is a part of the hindgut, and the gut tube it, itself is driven from the innermost or the third layer of the trilaminar germ disc or the, the trilaminar embryo, and that was the endoderm. So always remember that the gut tube, starting from the foregut till the hindgut, end of the hindgut, is driven from the endoderm, okay? So our cloaca is endodermal, okay? Then from either side of the cloaca, the the pelvic body wall will start sending extensions towards the midline, okay? As you can see, there's a sequential drawing. This brown colored uh, structure is known as the urorectal septum or uroanal septum, rather. So what happens that the, the mesoderm is growing fast from either side of the cloaca and trying to meet in the midline. This way, eventually it is going to divide the single cloacal cavity into two. An anterior cavity or the anterior sac with a cavity, that will be known as the primitive urinary bladder. And a posterior or the, the dorsal sac or cavity, which will be known as the primitive anorectal canal. Okay, so here you can see the end product. We have, instead of a single cavity, now we have two cavities. That means we have two sacs. <laughs> Excuse me. The anterior or ventral one is known as the primitive urinary bladder. And the posterior or dorsal one is known as the anal, primitive anorectal canal. Okay? Now, when this is happening, always keep in mind the, the primitive cloaca which now has become the anterior part of that primitive cloaca, has become the urinary bladder, is still receiving the, the two pairs of ducts, right? So if we move upward, we can see 
that this now, you don't call it cloaca anymore because we just have reached to this point and now we have started calling it the urinary bladder. Okay, let's, let's, before describing the sequence of drawings, let me show you how our primitive urinary bladder looks like. Okay, here it is. So you can see, so this is the ventral wall or the anterior wall of the primitive urinary bladder and facing the board is the posterior or the dorsal wall, okay, or the dorsal surface. We can see that the two primitive ureters are opening from the back side of the urinary bladder. That means they are opening or they are entering the bladder cavity from posterior, okay. So here you can see that this is the top part of the bladder and this is the bottom part, okay? And this is the actual body or the cavity. You can also appreciate that the cavity of the urinary bladder is extending like a finger-like, you know, extension or projection. And that if you recall, it was the allantois. When we were, like when you have studied the development of the mid-gut and hindgut, in the region of the hindgut, the, there is an extension from the cloaca that is extending into the connecting stalk or the umbilical cord, in other words. That extension is known as the allantois. Although it's a benign projection, but the thing is you can, right now you can imagine that the bladder cavity is continuing itself into the allantois. And the allantois is entering the connecting stalk and if you imagine the, the embryo or the fetus rather is having a, like a small rudimentary yolk sac and a, like along with the yolk sac the anterior body wall of the embryo is having this ex, you know cord like extension which we call the connecting stop. We don't call it the umbilical cord as yet. We call it the connecting stop because it has the yolk sac embedded in it. It has a set of blood vessels, the umbilical blood vessels, the veins and the arteries present inside that cord. They actually are intertwined and they are connecting the anterior body wall of the embryo. In other words, the entire uh, systems of the fetus with the placenta, okay? Because the fetus is still in the womb of the mother and it doesn't have a, a set of functional lungs. It doesn't have a, a set of functional kidneys which are responsible for getting rid of the toxins and providing oxygen. So the, the fetus is in bad need of maternal support, okay? So that is like a little bit away from our topic. You just have to remember that allantois is the extension, anterior extension, which will be running along with the other structures, like the, the blood vessels and the yolk sac within the connecting stalk, okay? So we can say that our primitive urinary bladder, the, the bladder cavity, is continuing upward within the allantois, okay? But that is not the case with us in the adult form. So we'll discuss it, what will, hap what, what will happen to this allantois or the fate of the allantois. Then the central part, or the, you can say that the, uh, the, the anterior part of the cloaca will become the urogenital sinus. We call it the sac which is responsible to give rise to the, the part of the urinary system and some parts of the genital system, okay? I'm not discussing the genital system as yet, so I'm not going to elaborate upon the urogenital sinus right now in this session, but I'll do it later on when we will discuss the reproductive system development, okay? So just stay calm. The thing is that the, the, the urogenital sinus has three parts. The upper part is known as the urinary bladder. Then it has a middle part, which is known as the, the, the pelvic part of the urogenital sinus. And then it has the lowest part, the lowest segment or the third segment is known as the phallic part of the urogenital sinus. This whole thing is the urogenital sinus. 
the top and the broadest part is known as the urinary bladder, prim primitive urinary bladder. The second narrower part is known as the pelvic part of the urogenital sinus, which will give rise to the urethra in both genders. And the phallic part, which is the, the terminal and the last segment of the urogenital sinus, is going to give rise to the penile urethra in the males. Okay? But we are basically at the moment are concerned with this top part, which is the urinary bladder, and it is receiving at the back of it, it is receiving on either side the two ureters, the right and left ureters. And the top part or the apex of this urinary bladder, primitive bladder, is showing an extension. It just tapers off. And it, this extension is known as the elantois. Ultimately what happens as the, the fetus is progressing in age within the intrauterine phase, the, the elantois, the lumen or the cavity of the elantois will get fibrosed. It will get blocked and will give rise to uh, like a supporting ligament because when, when, a, when a small cavity gets obliterated, it gets fibrosed, we stop calling it a cavity, we call it a like, sort of a ligament. Okay? So that ligament is known as the urecus during the fetal life. And ultimately, the urecus will transform in it. Once the baby is born, the connection is completely gone, the, the urecus gets further fibrosed, and will become the median umbilical ligament. In an adult, you will find a, like a cord-like structure or the fibrous cord extending from the apex of the bladder and reaching the umbilicus. That cord is known as median umbilical ligament with an N, not medial. It's the median umbilical ligament, which is the remnant of the urecus. And the urecus was the remnant of the elantois. Okay, I hope that you have understood the sequence. Now, uh, let's come back to our, the, our urinary bladder and what's going on. Uh, I have a, a, a sketched a sequence and you can see what, what are the fates of the mesonephric ducts which have been drawn in pink, if you recall from the yesterday uh, lecture, and the ureteric buds which were the outpocketing strong, the distal end of the mesonephric duct, they are also drawn in orange, okay, just like the last time. And this structure now, we call it the urinary bladder. We don't call it cloaca anymore. We call it the urinary bladder because we already have divided the cloaca. This is the later stages of development beyond the eighth week of the intrauterine life. Now the embryo has been called as fetus. After eight weeks of conception, you do not call that structure as an embryo, you call it a fetus because all the basic systems have been laid down, their foundations have been laid down and they will be growing further, developing further to achieve or acquire the, uh, their adult versions. Okay, so you don't call it the embryo, you call it the fetus. All right, so it's, as you can see the mesonephric ducts are opening independently into the, uh, the urinary bladder and the, the two ureters are out pocketing from the, uh, the sides of the mesonephric ducts. If you go further and look at this sketch, eventually as the kidneys are now, you have to imagine that they, the ureteric buds have contacted the metanephric blastema and the kidneys are developing. The permanent kidneys are developing in the sacral or the pelvic region and the ureters now are lengthening in size and they will open in, they will not open via the mesonephric ducts anymore. They are separate entities now. Okay? And they have their, their they have their you know collecting system developing within the, the tissue of the metanephric blastema. The kidney is also growing. So the ureters are now bringing the 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 secretion of the two kidneys that that, that is the egg the, you know, the excreta or the urine, the fetal urine. So they will be opening separately and slightly below the opening of the mesonephric ducts. Okay? Now, as the development of or the growth of the primitive bladder is progressing, what is going on? I told you yesterday that 
the, the intermediate mesoderm is giving rise to two systems together, like simultaneously. The urinary system, which we are discussing right now, and the genital system. So to keep in mind that along with the kidneys, the ureters, and the urinary bladder, uh, along with their development, the genital system is also developing. Okay, So the gonads are forming, and the duct system of the genital system are also developing. Okay, You have to keep in mind. You will be able to understand it very clearly in the next session. Right? But when you do the reproductive, the male reproductive system and the female reproductive system. But at the moment, you just have to remember the mesonephric ducts, they have been used by the genital system. Okay? So they have they still they do exist. But what happens as they keep on penetrating, they are they are keep on going deeper in the uh, primitive bladder cavity. The medial ends, so these were the, or, or the distal ends, you can say, uh, these were the proximal ends of the mesonephric ducts. So the distal end of the two mesonephric ducts, they will come so close to each other in the midline that they'll fuse. <laughs> and then they, they will give rise to a triangular patch, which will be located in the back wall or the posterior wall, the dorsal wall of the primitive urinary bladder. And we call this, because by looking at the shape of this patch, it's triangular, so we have named it the trigone of the bladder. Excuse me. So, so if I say the trigone of our urinary bladder is driven, it's originally developed from the mesonephric duct. Or if anybody asks you, what is the embryonic origin of the trigone of bladder, your answer should be the mesonephric ducts. Okay? which are the extensions of the intermediate mesoderm. And we know that the urinary bladder from inside is completely lined with endoderm, right? Because it, the bladder is an extension or it's the, it's, the, it's the part of the cloaca, which is the part of the hindgut. And we, we just have discussed that the, the gut tube is developing from the endoderm. And so is the urinary bladder. But the trigone of the bladder is not endodermal in origin. It is mesodermal in origin. Okay? Because it's developing from the, uh, the fusion of the two mesonephric ducts. Got it? Now, the placement or the position of our ureters, the, the fetal ureters, will be opening. They will find the two, end, the two ends of the base of the trigone. So they will open up on either side of the base of the trigone. So this is the trigone with, the, with an apex facing downward towards the urethra, the future urethra, and this is the base, okay? So on either side of the base of the trigone, each ureter will be opening and horizontally, okay? Then you can see that the mesonephric ducts, after forming the, uh, the trigone of the bladder, which is a part which will stay, uh, even in the adult product, the, the bladder, the trigone will stay. But the mesonephric ducts, they usually get detached. And then they have been used by the uh, male gonads as their duct. And we will discuss them. Don't forget the mesonephric ducts. Well, I'm going to use this term every now and then when I will be discussing the development of the male reproductive system, okay? Now, what happens that first you have to, to look at the position of the, or the, the relationship between the mesonephric duct and the ureters. The mesonephric ducts are always crossing the ureters from the front, anterior, okay? Just keep in mind. Now, in this last sketch, you can see that the position of the opening of the ureters is being slightly changed. So if you remember, I kept on mentioning that the kidneys, they developed in the pelvic cavity and then they started their ascent. And you know that the kidneys are absolutely connected with the ureters. So as the length of, as the kidneys are ascending, Climbing back into the abdominal cavity, the length of the ureters will be increasing. And the other thing, 
the angle at which they are opening in the trigone on either side from the same, you know, uh, um, what should I say? It, instead of staying horizontal, I'm talking about the openings of the urinary, uh, of the ureters or the orifices of the ureters. Instead of staying horizontally placed, they will be getting slightly slant, slanted and then ultimately oblique because the kidneys are pulling the ureters upward while they are ascent. Okay? So that actually is extremely important because the vesico-uretric valve, valve is literally like a door, you know, which is going to check the entry exit, entry exit. Valve anywhere in our, in our body is controlling the exit and entry of fluids, isn't it? We have the valves in the, in the, in the heart. We have the valves in the esophagus. We have the valves everywhere to check and balance. So here, the fluid which will be entering the urinary bladder is known as urine. To check the entry of the urine and keeping the urine inside the bladder cavity, you need to have a valve system, okay, a door system. That cannot be present at this level because the ureters are at the levels, at the same level as of the trigone. The, their opening is at the same level. As they climb up along with the kidneys, the angle, they, they, the opening, the orifice of the ureter is being angulated now. So this angle acts like a valve, okay? And it is checking. Once the bladder is completely filled to its maximum limit, even then the there is a one-way valve. But this angle has created a one-way one valve. So as the bladder is filled, the valve will shut. Right? And it will never permit the urine to climb back towards the kidney. The retrograde flow of urine is being checked or prohibited by the urethro or vesico-ureteric valve. You have to understand that this obliquity during the developmental step stages. So this obliquity during the developmental stages of the ureters and the kidney system is extremely is playing a crucial role, right? If now imagine if the kidneys fail or one of the kidneys fails to escape the pelvic cavity. What will happen? The, the angle between the trigone of the bladder and the opening of the ureter or the ureteric orifice will have the same plane. So that will lead to, like whenever the bladder is full, the urine will leak because there will be no obliquity and there will be no valve. So the bladder, once it is filled, or even partially filled, it will allow the urine to, to, you know, move backward or seep through that ureteric valve back into the ureter, a short ureter, and will enter via the pelvic, uh, renal pelvis into the cortex of the kidney. And we know that the urine is extremely toxic and extremely harmful for even for the organ which is responsible for its production, that is the kidney. It is extremely harmful for the nephrons. So in such cases, when there is a pelvic kidney or the kidney is close to the pelvic brain, it did not scape the pelvic cavity or just lying just close to the pelvic cavity, there will be no angulation. There will be no vesico-ureteric valve and that will lead to retrograde flow of urine and that will lead to hydronephrosis and you know many more complications okay so that's why it's very important to understand these steps all right so we are done with the partitioning of the cloaca formation of the trigone and by the way i told you that in the beginning the inner lining of the urinary bladder because it is derived from the endoderm gut endoderm so it's endodermal 
the entire epithelial lining of the inside of the urinary bladder is endodermal in origin, except for this small triangular patch, which will be mesodermal. Okay? But as uh, the fetus is progressing and reaching to term, by that time, this the, the top part of the trigone of the bladder is also covered by endodermal mesoderm, uh, endodermal epithelium. Okay, so we can say that in a, in an adult bladder, the even the trigone of the bladder, the surface of the trigone of bladder is also covered by endodermal epithelium. Okay, the transitional epithelium is uniformly distributed. Okay, all right. Now, so we are done with the. Uh, uh, formation of the trigone. Now, one more thing, if we move down to this illustration, and I was mentioning in the beginning that the, 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 the primitive urinary bladder, it, from its apex, is communicating, because it is adapted to the, the extension, which is a, like a sausage-shaped extension, we call it the, we used to call it the allantois in the very primitive stages, in the embryonic stages. As the embryo has crossed that eight week time frame, now we call it the fetus, and we, we just have discussed that at whatever is happening, like the, the partitioning of the cloaca, formation of the primitive urinary bladder is happening beyond eight, the eighth week of intrauterine life, right? So that allantois has become uricus or uracus, okay? So this is known as a fibrous tube which is present in the fetus and we call it the uricus. If you, hypothetically speaking, if you take a, a, like a sharp needle and insert it near the belly button of a child and you just pass it down, so you actually are passing your needle or catheter through this uracus and ultimately will be ending up in the bladder cavity. Keep this in mind, okay? We still, all of us, like all the adults, still have this pathway. Although it is closed, in normal circumstances, it has to stay closed. But it can be used in certain emergency situations like laparoscopic surgeries or the removal of bladder stones via laparoscopy, right? So the surgeons, they do use this route, which is a direct, and instead of opening up the, the pelvic abdominal wall, they just use this pathway, okay? The uracal pathway, which is in adults, you don't call it the uracus anymore. You start calling it the median, because it is in the midline, umbilical, because it is heading to the umbilicus ligament, because it is like a cord, doesn't have a space or doesn't have a cavity, okay? Like your ductus arteriosus, is, if it is open, you call it the patent ductus arteriosus, which was the demand or requirement of the fetal period to, to, to shunt the blood. But in, in us, it is no more present. We, instead, we call it the ligamentum arteriosum. Okay? It's like a fibrous cord. So same is the, is the case with the uracus and the median umbilical ligament. Okay? The surgeons approach the urinary bladder cavity via the median umbilical ligament. Now, I think it is pretty clear to you. Now, what happens if it just fails to, during development, the fibrosis doesn't happen? It, the uracus fail to get, get fibrosed. So there will be some sort of connection. So we will call it, so you can see that it's not fibrosed and the uracus is still patent or open and we call it the uracal fistula. Okay, a connection which is abnormal. A fistula is never normal. We don't have fistula in our body. Unless and until something failed to close down in normal circumstances, okay? So now you can say, you can you can easily predict that the bladder is having urine, and the urine, you know, can you know it just it, it can trickle down or it can 
you know, climb up through this fistula and can dribble down. So what I have sketched, this is the anterior abdominal wall and this is the belly button, this is the umbilicus. Okay? In normal circumstances, when the baby is born, the uracus is fibrosed, so bladder contains its con contents. And there, there is no escape of that, that content up to the anterior abdominal wall. But in case of failure of closure of the uracus, of fibrosis of the uracus, will lead to a uracal fistula. And that will lead to, whenever the bladder is full in the, in the newborn, but there will be dribbling of urine via this fistula onto the anterior abdominal wall, through the umbilicus. Okay? Then sometimes what happens, there is like, a, like partly the uracus is, there is a partial fibrosis. Say for example, it's fibrosed at its proximal end and then fibrosed up here, but in the center, it just stays patent, open. So there will be some collection of fluid here and it will become like a small balloon. So you call it the uracal cyst. Cyst is any blind pouch with some fluid. Okay? Usually cysts are not empty. Okay? Some tissue fluid is always there. Uracal cyst. Uh, so that is the significance of the, the, the fate of the elantois is formation of the uracus and the fate of the uracus is the ultimate formation of the median umbilical ligament and that stays in the adult life, okay? All right, so we are done with the formation of the uracus and the fate. Now, I just also want to talk about some of the commonly found congenital anomalies or malformations of the kidneys and the urinary uh, and the ureters. Okay, so if you remember, first of all, uh, we did talk about our ureteric butt, like this one. Okay, so let's erase. The rest. Right. So here we have our melanophic plastema. This was our like indifferentiated state of intermediate mesoderm lying here. Doesn't know what to do. Till the ureteric butt just, you know reached to the melanophic plastema and then divided into two branches because the dichotomous division and then the transformation of melanophic plastema started and ultimately the plastema will give rise to a proper excretory system okay we just have discussed yes yesterday sometimes what happens that this ureteric bud instead of like this single ureter the, the mesonephric duct instead of giving off a single bud it just gives off two buds so there is the main one and then this one is the aberrant or the abnormal ureteric bud so what will happen to this bud the main bud is going to go and be in contact with the future kidney the metanephric plastema and it will, it will divide into a whole set of collecting ducts and tubules, okay? That is its fate. But what about the, the, the additional or the um, aberrant ureteric bud? It will grow. And will grow and ultimately will open up here. Either it will open up at the lowest part of the urethra, the future urethra, or sometimes in females, it does open up in the vagina. So we can say it's a duplicated ureter. Okay? Why there is duplication of ureters in some people, in, like in rare circumstances? Because of the abnormal division of the ureteric butt. So instead of mesonephric duct giving rise to one ureteric butt, it gave rise to two. 
So the, the first one will, will know what to do. It will go and will induct the metanephroblastema and will become a part of the collecting system of that kidney. But the other one is just a wandering here and there. So it becomes the secondary ureter and will open up either into the lower part of the urethra or in case of female, sometimes it does open up into the vagina. Okay, so that is the duplication of ureter. Sometimes what happens, the ureteric bud and the metanephric blastema, they just, so this is the bud and there is no additional bud. Okay, here, this single ureteric bud and it just failed, it failed to touch the metanephric blastema. There will be no genetic, so the, 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 the genetic coding, the expression of genes occurs only in that situation when the, the tip of the ureteric bud will touch the metanephric blastema. It is going to, so the metanephric blastema is going to induce some changes in the ureteric bud and the ureteric bud uh, genes will induce some ch very vital changes in the metanephric blastema. Okay. It's a two-way process. Now what happens? The blastema is there, the intermediate mesoderm in the sacral region is present, ready to get transformed, but the ureteric bud failed to reach that or touch that metanephric blastema. So there will, that this condition will lead to agenesis. There will be no kidney. Usually it's unilateral ag renal agenesis. One sided kidney is absent. The other side kidney is present. So there will be, you know, hyperplasia of the nephrons of that kidney. So because they have to take care of the, the other side. Okay? So the, the fetus definitely will be able to survive. Um, in fact, I would say the newborn will certainly be able to survive with a, like an intensive care. Okay? In case of unilateral renal agenesis. But in case, sometimes what happens, the, both the ureteric bites will fail to touch the metanephric blastema. There will be no kidneys at all. So that, will, that condition is known as congenital bilateral renal agenesis. So during the intrauterine phase, I would say the fetus will be able to stay alive. It will not die within the womb. Now, I already have explained why this, this can happen. Because the kidneys during the intrauterine life, just like the lungs, are not functional. They are not functional into their the normal extent. Because the, the lungs, they are present, but the direct fetus is submerged in the amniotic fluid, so the lungs do not get oxygen. So they cannot perform their normal function during the intrauterine phase. They will be functional once the fetus has become a newborn, has come out of the amniotic cavity. Okay? Same as the case with the, with the kidneys. The fetus is swallowing the amniotic fluid and the amniotic fluid gets absorbed by blood and has been traveling within the, like, in the blood vessels and the, the blood vessels will become the glomeruli and the kidney nephrons or like the primitive kidney nephrons are going to process that and will, will, will produce urine as an excretion and then the urine will again go back to the amniotic, will be an addition to the amniotic fluid. Okay? So in case of renal agenesis, there will be one, one drawback. The fetus will suffer from um, oligohydroamnios. There will be less amniotic fluid because the kidneys are not one of the kidneys is not present or both of the kidneys are absent so there will be severe oligohydroamnios less amniotic fluid but the baby will or the fetus will stay like alive because the role of the kidneys is being played by the placenta okay so there will be no accumulation of toxins within the body but once this baby with, what, once this fetus has become a baby, has been born with no kidneys, bilateral renal agenesis will cause the newborn death because he will not be able to survive for a longer time. 
unless and until you put him on the dialysis machine and that will also not completely cure the situation or the condition, he eventually will die. Okay? So we have to keep in mind. Then sometimes what happens that the kidneys, as I, I have mentioned yesterday, the kidneys initially develop within the pelvic cavity. Here, sorry. So we have our narrow triangular pelvic cavity and the cavity is loaded with other organs which are developing. The urinary bladder is developing, the uterus in females is developing, the prostate in males is de developing, the anal canal in the rectum is there, right? There are blood vessels. So the kidneys are overcrowded. Sometimes what happens during the developmental sequence, the, one of the kidneys has, like the kidneys, they start their ascent in normal circumstances. One of the kidneys, it just gets stuck at the pelvic brain because of the narrow space. Sometimes that kidney just stops at the pelvic brain or stays within the pelvic cavity. And the other kidney is down the part, reached the uh, lumbar level and has met with the uh, adrenal gland of that side. So in that case, we call it a pelvic kidney. So the person has both kidneys functional, but if you'll scan, if you'll take an x-ray, there will be shadow of the left kidney present in the flank, in the lumbar region. The right kidney is missing. But the right kidney is present in the pelvic region, just close to the pelvic brim. The only problem, so the person will be able to live a normal life because they are, he has both the kidneys present. But there will be chances of frequent infections because I just have told you the angle of the ureter where it is opening into the trigone of the bladder is very important. That angulity or the obliquity is very important. So in case of a pelvic kidney, this person probably will be suffering from frequent renal infections. Or eventually if, if that condition will stay untreated, will, will lead to hydronephrosis, okay? But the other very scary thing that can happen that in case of you know surgical procedure that a person has been gone through in the pelvic region, the surgeon might will find a, like an a abnormal pelvic mass. Sometimes that kidney is compressing over one of the pelvic nerves or the vessels. So that will lead to excruciating pain. So during a surgical procedure, a surgeon by mistake can remove that pelvic mass. And actually that pelvic mass was the actual functional kidney. Okay, so these are the few drawbacks of the pelvic kidney. Sometimes what happens, as I said that the, the pelvic cavity, the fetal pelvic cavity is a very crowded room. And the kidneys, when they are developing, if you look at this sketch, they are developing, and we just have discussed yesterday, that the lower poles of the kidneys, the two kidneys, they usually are pretty much closer to the midline, okay? And, and I have mentioned that in the beginning, before their ascent, the renal pelvises are facing the front or the ventral surface of the kidney, okay? So they are developing like this in norm, normal fetuses. Sometimes what happens, this is pretty much close. Like the, the, the media or the, sorry, the lower poles of the kidneys, they, they grow very close to each other. And then sometimes what happens, they, they touch the, 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 the kidney tissue of the lower poles of both kidneys. They are, you know, touching each other. Okay? So they are gluing together, sticking together. And then what happens, when they are climbing, here is our poor little vessel, which we have named as inferior mesenteric artery. Normally, the function of the inferior mesenteric artery is to supply the lower part, the lowest part of the hindgut. Okay? But this is, although it's a very small stub, but it is a vascular stub. Okay? So when the, these fused, the, the kidneys with, the, with their lower ends fused together, when they try to, they, to, to make their ascent, when they reach at the level of the lower lumbar vertebrae, if you recall from your previous, uh, you know, gastrointestinal vasculature knowledge, 
that the level of inferior mesenteric artery and the level of the superior mesenteric artery, so the SMA is somewhere around L1, right, L2, right? So the, the inferior mesenteric is at the lower lumbar level between L4 and L5, just above the sacral region. The kidneys develop in the sacral region. They were getting their blood supply from the sacral part of the uh, aorta, right? But as they started their ascent, in this case, with the partially fused kidneys, when they will reach to this inferior mesenteric artery level, the artery will act like a stopper. Because now you can, you can imagine these kidneys, they pretty much are, you know, formed and they are like this. Right? So when they will hit this stub, the stub of the inferior mesenteric artery will prevent the upward ascent of this horseshoe shaped kidney. We call it a horseshoe shaped kidney because it does resemble a horseshoe. Okay, so that kidney, the two fused, the kidneys with the fused lower poles will be lying below the level of inferior mesenteric artery, which, which means, in other words, you will find a horseshoe shaped mass or a shadow, if you are performing a scan or an x-ray on that person, you will find a horseshoe shaped mark, uh, 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 um, shadow just below the emergence of the inferior mesenteric artery that is the lower lumbar level, just above the pelvic brain. Okay? So sit, the kidneys, the fused kidneys are sitting on top of the pelvic brain. They are out of the pelvic cavity but haven't reached their normal, normal actual destination. Okay? So that is one thing. The nephrons are functional, absolutely functional. They are performing their role. But the main problem with these kind of people who were suffering from horseshoe kidneys, the kidneys are lying at the lower level. And if you remember, I told you when during their ascent, the ventral surfaces of the kidneys, or like there will be a 90 degree medial rotation that has to happen. So the ventral surface will become the medial surface. And the, so the renal pelvises well, from the ventral position, they will come to a medial position. This whole thing will never happen in such people. So they will have their, just like the pelvic kidney situation, both of their renal pelvises will be anteriorly facing. Right? And because they are closer to the pelvic cavity, they are close, in other words, they are closer to the urinary bladder, so the angle between the the ureters and the trigone or the orifice will not be oblique. So there will be, there are frequent chances of hydro, bilateral hydronephrosis. That is the backward flow of urine. Once the bladder is full, the, the urine will re reflux back into the renal pelvis. Okay? If the hydronephrosis stays, and untreated for a longer time, the person definitely will suffer from glomerulonephritis and then it, like at mass level there will be destruction of the nephrons in, in, in both kidneys in this cases and in, in that kidney in case of pelvic kidney, in one kidney, okay? So the, these are the few uh, congenital malformations. One, one last one which is left is sometimes people are born with cysts. We call them the isolated renal cysts, or sometimes the whole kidney is filled with cysts. And by cyst, I mean the nephrons will not be functional. Okay? So what happens here, uh, we have our metanephric blastema, uh, this big one. Okay? So we have this nephric tissue. Sometimes what happens that the ureteric butt, because it is splitting, like that there is a dichotomous division, we all know that. So there was like, one is always dividing into two. Dividing into two, okay? This one is dividing into two. Sometimes what happens, this blastema did not receive its ureteric butt, okay? So the blastema is gonna become the nephron. 
it is, it is becoming the nephron because the induction is there because most of the ureteric bud extensions have reached the metanephric blastema and there is a transformation of the blastema to become the excretory units. So what will happen, there will be no connection between the nephric tubules, that means the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. So if you remember that, you know, you have this, uh, let me sketch it. So you have this Bowman's capsule, right? And then you have your uh, glomerulus, the capillary tuft is there, the afferent and efferent arterioles are there, everything is formed. And then you have the, uh, the PCT, that is the proximal convoluted tubule, which is this one. And then you have the loop of Henle, and then you have a distal convoluted tubule. But what will happen? There is no collecting duct. Okay? So there is no collecting duct. So when the, there is no collecting duct, the the blood is being filtered or, or have been, you know, sieved and the whatever product, which is, you can call it urine or you can call it the excreta, excreta is being formed and is being trickling down through this nephric tubule set. Proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule. But there is no way to go. So what will happen in this case? There will be accumulation because the blood is continuously pouring like it's been com com continuously uh, you know uh, circulating the glomerulus so the nephron is continuously producing the filtrate but the filtrate doesn't have any way to escape out the nephron which in normal circumstances what happens the filtrate by the time it reaches the distal convoluted tubule is left with nothing but toxic material so we start calling it urine and that has been collected by the collecting duct isn't it but this is not the case in case of congenital renal cyst so this nephron will balloon up with its own filtrate and the person will be born with like blebs like water filled blebs on the surface of the kidney so what can happen, like uh, what are the, the drawbacks of the renal cyst? Say for example, is if a person, if a baby is born with like a, a right kidney filled with like 30% filled with cysts. So that means that 30% of the nephrons of that kidney are non-functional. They are not producing urine. They are filtering blood but that filtrate is staying in those cysts, is not draining out of the, of the, of the kidney. So the, the function of that right kidney will just be 70%, not 100%, okay? And one more thing which I just forgot to, to, to mention yesterday when we were discussing the development of the kidneys and the nephrons, we are born with a fixed number of nephrons. So each kidney is roughly having 1 to 1.5 million nephrons. So traditionally we are born with our 3 million nephrons, fixed number. The number of nephrons will never increase, right? But the fetal kidney, it does resemble like a lobulated. The fetal kidney is always, always lobulated. Because the, the, bulb, the bumps are, because there are nephrons multiplying and creating bumps on the surface of the, of the kidney. If you compare a fetal kidney with an adult kidney, adult kidney is always very glistening and smooth, right? This is what is happening. Once we are born with that fixed number of nephrons, like one to three million, like in fact, uh, three million nephrons, each kidney will also be having connective tissue. And it's just the, the, the length of the, of the nephrons will be increasing and the number of, uh, and, the, and the quantity of the connecting, uh, uh, connective tissue will be increasing. That will lead to the increase in the size of the kidney as well as will lead to the smoothness uh, on the surface of the kidney. 
It's not the number of nephrons that will be increasing exactly like, like uh, the, the neurons. We are born, uh, like what, the number of neurons is always, once the neurons are formed, they are formed. If one neuron is dead, it is dead. It will not be replaced. Same is the case with the nephrons. We are born with those 1.5 million nephrons in one kidney. If half of the kidney is being damaged due to hydronephrosis or nephritis or any kind of a fulminating infection, say for example, out of those 1.5 million, 500,000 nephrons are gone. So we are left with 1 million and then we can be left with you know, just 10,000 or 15,000 or 20,000. So the function of the kidney will just be regressing. It can never improve because the nephrons which are dead are dead forever. They will never be replaced. Okay? So these are the things which we have to keep in mind that the size of the kidney does not increase as we grow older from an infant to a, an adult. It does not increase because of the number of nephrons are increasing. It's because the the length or the size of the nephron is increasing as well as the amount of connective tissue is increasing. Okay? So yeah, that's all. I hope that you have understood this session. And by the way, the PowerPoint that has been provided to you, has been uploaded on the canvas, is the actual lecture. And this video lecture is supplementing that information. Okay? It's just going to help you understand the, the sequence of slides in your PowerPoint. Thank you very much.